Hey people, how are you doing? Welcome. It's 8th of March 2022 and you are either joining us live to watch the Sports Therapy Association and podcast and video cast or maybe you're listening to the podcast and this has already happened and I am something in the past uh, which is great as well. Um, we are here as we are always on Tuesday nights at 8 o'clock UK time and um, in case you are new to the show or you're listening to the podcast then what we're doing here, I mean we're on episode 91, that's 91 weeks without fail um, for the Sports Therapy Association podcast. Um, it all came out of COVID, about therapists wanting to come together and talk, and they've got questions, and the Sports Therapy Association kind of jumped in and thought, guys, we need to talk. We need to have a little base and a platform for us to get together and share ideas and support each other in these troubled times, and it's kept on going. So here we are. Um, what we are doing now is we're focusing on uh, one topic per month. Uh, we've been doing that since January. So, for example, last month in February, it was all about women's health. We had some fantastic episodes with some great educators and speakers. Um, it's all on YouTube or on your favorite podcast app. You can download them. This month, we're talking about CPD, um, continued or continuing professional development in the UK in March and April. So we're focusing on some CPD, which we think it might be worth checking out. Um, as I explained last week, it's not that you have to do everything I'm saying at all, at all, not at all. Um, it's a case, as we mentioned last week, of looking at where you are, what you're trying to achieve, where you work, what sort of clinic you got, where your interests are, who your target audience is, where your strengths are, your weaknesses are, all these things which um, go to help you decide what CPD you need to do or should be doing. So please don't uh, believe that all the guests I bring on here, you have to sign up and do their CPD. Um, you could do a lot worse if you've got the DOSH, but you don't have to at all. It's just to stimulate some thought. And if they are coming to a place near you and you are interested, for example, in um, improving your knowledge about working with tendinopathy, then, hey, tonight's guest, Dr. Pete, Peter Maliaris, is a pro, a pro in that department. Um, and when it comes to tendinopathy and working um, with rehabilitation of that, then, yeah, you don't get much better than what we've got tonight. So I'm very excited about bringing him on. Um, so before I do that, let's just say thank you to last week. Um, last week's guest uh, who started off this focus on CPD, we had uh, Daniel Williams and Mike Grice from Movement Therapy Education. And they were talking about um, a dermo neuro, bleh, dermo neuro modulation course, which is coming to the UK for the first time. Um, founded by Diane Jacobs from Canada. Uh, it's a fascinating, um, what should we call it? System, really. I've seen it described in the past. I can't remember who described Jajit Kundo. I think it might have been Nick Ng of Massage and Fitness Magazine. I think I did see him mentioning it. It's kind of like Jeet Kune Do in the sense that it's putting everything together and then adapting it according to the individual in front of you. Um, I think one of the nicest suggestions last week or conclusions was it really does bring the bio and the cycle and the social together. It's all about the effect of touching um, the individual in front of you on the nervous system, on the subcutaneous nervous system, so the skin. Um, so it's a fantastic episode. I really appreciate uh, Mike and Dan's um, stepping in. The two tutors who are coming over from um, the USA unfortunately weren't able to join us live because of other commitments but the course is going to be taught by Mike Rioch and Ray Allen um, and it's going to be in Birmingham on March 12th 13th 14th and then uh, in Exeter with James Morgan of Barefoot Physio on March um, the weekend after that so 18 19 20 and then the second part of the course is in June and it'll do the same thing one week in Birmingham, which will be June 4, 5, 6, and then the second week in Exeter, 10, 11, 12. All details can be found on the respective websites of these people. So if you look in movement therapy education or look at Barefoot Physio, um, you'll find uh, details where you can sign up. And as always, if you've got any feedback or other questions, then feel free to send them through to Matt at Run Chat Live. No, not that. Sorry, I am Matt from Run Chat Live. Sorry, I've been updating the website. Send it to matt at thesta.co.uk. Um, now, I'm just looking at my phone briefly. You can't see me on the podcast, obviously, but I'm just a bit concerned because Pete Maliaris, I can't actually see you at the moment. Pete, you've disappeared from my lobby, so um, I can't see anything. So, Pete, if you can see this or hear me, then please sign out and come back in again. I'll keep the show going until you arrive, Peter. Don't worry. It's fine. We're pros. 
um people are coming in already if you're joining us live then thanks very much gary benson founder of the sta is here with us so great time to pin gary down if you've got any questions about sports therapy anything he wants just chuck it in the comments and he will answer because he can't help himself uh, hey gary thanks for joining us uh phil griffiths is here good evening phil hope you're well and Catherine Reimer, of course, is with us saying hi, everyone. And when you do come and join us live, then I bring up your comments onto the screen. So it's a nice way to showcase your um, Facebook or YouTube logo. Great, Peter's here. I was worrying then. Um, and also it's a great way of networking. You get to hang out with soft tissue therapists. If you're in the UK, then it's fantastic because you can just ask around and you'll probably find someone down the road from you. Um, so it really is a great networking opportunity and we do encourage you, if you can to join us live on Tuesdays at eight o'clock. Uh, right. So like I say, tonight's guest is um, I've I'm very, very, very excited because I've never actually had a chance to sit down and chat with um, Dr. Peter Maliaris, even though I've probably followed him for 10 years plus. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking all about um, the lower limb tendinopathy, mastering lower limb tendinopathy uh, workshop, which is coming to the UK um, all the way from sunny Melbourne. I'm presuming it's sunny. Um, and we'll talk about the dates later on in the show. But just to give you an idea before I bring up Dr. Peter Maliaris. We're talking about um, for March the 20th in Newport, though I hear that's been sold out already or practically. Um, Epsom, March the 25th, London, March the 26th and potentially Surrey, March the 27th, if the demand is there as well. So that is what it's all about. Um, without further ado, I should bring up the man himself, Dr. Peter Maliaris. Hey, mate, how are you doing? Good, man. How are you? <laughs> I'm better now. I was worried for a while. You went for a little walk or something, did you? Or just a look in some I, I, I don't know what happened. I, I don't know if I had to press something. I was just waiting and then I... When, when you said that, uh, I thought this is a long intro, but then you said, oh, you're waiting for me. I I went uh, I went out and back in again. And oh, it I'm so glad you could hear me. Good. It's fine. It's very yeah. professional. Great. We're working then. So, um, so yeah. you're in Melbourne at the moment, are you? You're not in the UK yet. You're still in Melbourne? I am in Melbourne. Yeah, yeah. So so coming over for the course, as you said, uh, the uh, just, just the uh, the Epsom one is the one that's sold out. The other ones oh, are... Right. Still, I'm still okay, but um, yeah. So coming over, I'm in Melbourne till what is it Wednesday here? So I uh, leave on Monday uh, and fly out. Then I've got a conference in Copenhagen. Uh -huh. uh, for, I've got a conference that I'm talking at, um, and then I'll uh, fly back to London and uh, and do the courses over there and, and meet up with a few people. Yeah, look, looking forward to it because it's been obviously a long time without any travel, especially in your part of the world, isn't it? It's been quite strict over there, isn't it? Yeah, I'm glad to see things are moving a bit better now. Yeah, excellent. So, um, bum, 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 bum. yeah, we can really kind of get into it. We've had a little chat off air about what I'm hoping to achieve tonight. As always, um, the people who download this podcast, I get to see kind of what they do. And that if only they knew the information I've got on them, everyone who clicks that download button, it's huge. But not really. But it's for people who have probably... Some of them are at graduate level. They've done sports degrees. That's a certain percentage. But a lot of it is um, soft tissue therapists, particularly sports massage therapists, be it level three, who technically aren't allowed. Well, they're not allowed to work with injury unless they did it pre-2016. And then level four, which in the UK means you are allowed to work with injury. But as I teach level three and four, and I would do a five if I found one that was decent enough, it's kind of there's no mention of loading level five tends to be here's more novel ways of touching people depending what's kind of fashionable at the time when i did it back in 2000 and whenever it was six or seven it was all about myofascial release these days there's probably other things and so we are dealing with an audience and i don't say this belittling anyone who's listening to the podcast who probably if you're only sticking to what you've been taught haven't really been shown much loading at all um so this is going to be useful for you. But if there's certain things which don't make sense, then the first thing I want to do, and I've got to congratulate you, Peter, on your website. I've been, I've, obviously, I've got so many websites I try and get in touch with, but cracking blog and cracking podcast, mate, really good. Um, Thank I'll you. Bring it up on the screen here for people to see who are watching the show. So, tendinopathy rehabilitation. The actual website is tendinopathyrehab.com. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's right. I think it is, isn't it? just to be had yep. um and as well as details about the course mastering low limb tendinopathy fifth edition also if you look at the blog then there's some fantastic information out there and it's really friendly it's um 
all the guests I kind of end up talking to, which I love, just manage to speak in normal language, which everyone can can achieve. And I know that sports therapists have got an awful lot of imposter syndrome going on, but really go to this blog and have a little look. It's done really friendly. And you've also got the podcast as well, all 13, 14 minute chats about different papers that come out. Really friendly site, mate. Um, you put you. a lot of work thank into you it, don't you? Appreciate that. Appreciate that. No, thank you. Does it take a lot of work? Because it's really up to date. You're uh, always kind of trying to stuff I out. didn't. Yeah, I, I, it did. It did. I, it uh, at the time when I got it up and going, it was like three or four years of background work, and obviously because you're working full time, you, you you're not spending the full time on it, and uh, it takes ages. It it did take the course itself took me probably three or four years to develop over time, and. Uh, I was doing little face-to-face -face courses, but then just building on it. I've been doing tendon courses from 2006, which I can't believe now. It's ages, but I, uh, I bet it's, yeah, it's evolved a lot. It changes every year because I update it with the evidence, but it's, um, it, uh, yeah, it, it's changed a lot. And every time I do a series like this, I, for me to get excited about teaching it, I've got to make it new. I can't, I can't. I can't teach the same course because you just not you haven't got the enthusiasm. So I've I've got to I've got to be teaching new things that I'm doing in the clinic and new things that I'm thinking about with tendon patients because it's always it's always evolving. The the way you're treating people is always evolving from the things you're learning in clinic, but also the evidence. So uh, so what I'll do in the UK is uh, my first that when I'm at the conference or the first few days on the plane I'll update the course and that will take me a few days and then so that the course that i'll deliver in the uk will be the brand new course um which I, which which is yet to be written <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. but, but it's, ge it's generally just a it's generally just an update of of, of the course it's not <clears throat> obviously not a not a complete overhaul but an update and it's it just it, it makes it interesting for you as well because you, you've got to you know as you know yourself you, when you're teaching something you want to be passionate about it and um and that's and and you're passionate about delivering new info to people not the same old stuff that you've been talking about for years that's a really healthy way of looking at it um because i think one of the barriers which people who teach and maybe have been teaching for a long time soft tissue therapy is they they're scared of saying something that's different mm -hmm. it's like they worry that they have to take back something they were teaching even five ten years ago as if that's going to make them feel less credible and maybe mm -hmm. say well, actually you know i mm -hmm. said you could you know feel a hair through the yellow pages using your elbow which was a famous <laughs> quote by one of the most famous <laughs> soft tissue therapists in the uk <laughs> and beyond mm -hmm. that was the trick you know i'll find that pay i'll tell you whether there's a hair in there it's okay to turn around, isn't it? I mean, it shows progression, like you said. If you are actually keeping up to date, things should change, shouldn't they? Oh, without a doubt. I, I think um, it's the. But if you think about the scientific sort of process, it is. It's iterative and it's uh, and it's self-correcting and it changes over time. So uh, the whole process of learning is the same. It's just you've got to you've got to be a lifelong learner. There's you know the things I was doing in two thousand six in my course. Um, although the fundamentals were right, I was still telling people to pretty much the same messages. I don't think there's much fundamentals that have changed, but there's certainly lots around that that has changed uh, with evidence and, and other things. So, yeah, I think I think I think I agree. It's, it's it's really important to you know keep it fresh for yourself, but also um, you know keeping up with the evidence. And, and there's nothing wrong with saying what I thought five years ago was um, you know not what I think now. And that goes with for, with patients as well, I guess, isn't it? Having that confidence to actually say to a patient, which I know a lot of people struggle with, you know what, we've been trying this and I've read something which kind of means maybe we're going to do a little bit more of this now and back off this. That's fine as well. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It, 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 it's, it's, it's the same with patients. You, um, um, it's the same with patients. You know, it's, it's, it's just presenting, presenting the evidence. And um, I, I, I sort of, with patients, it's... Um, is it's obviously, you know, you're seeing them for a certain period of time. With you, know, you might see them for a few months, maybe. Um, so the evidence doesn't change that much in that time that you see them. Um, so the approach that I generally take with patients is um, uh, just presenting all the evidence to them and letting them make some decisions as well. 
Uh, so what what you know what what is the evidence for all these things that I'm suggesting? Because uh, otherwise, you tend to fall into your own biases of thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to do this, this, and this with every patient because I, you know, because I'm good at it or I enjoy it or I think it's going to work for them. Um, but it's uh, probably may or may not be this also the same thing that the patient wants to wants to have to have done. Um, so I think I think the power of the patient in making decisions is also very important. Excellent. That's going to be really refreshing to people listening. And it's a consistent message, which I love to hear guests say in the last throughout the last kind of 90 weeks where it's, it's cool to kind of change and twist and the patient's not going to go, how can you say that? You, everything you were telling me, uh, you know, a few weeks ago is, or a month ago or last year is wrong now. And it's, it's cool. It's a good conversation. <laughs> Catherine's just coming here with a comment saying, um, it even says that in trail guide of the body, how many pages of paper can you feel a hair through? I did that test. Yeah. And it's still being sold and pushed. And it's kind of something which in particular soft tissue, um, kind of therapists have to deal with now. There's a lot of it out there. I'm just saying hello to people. All, the, all these people have come in the last five minutes. If you go and sit at the back, um, I'll be speaking to you individually. It is kind of 2018 now, Becky Cow. What are you doing, woman? How can you just walk in here now when Dr. Peter Maliaris is here in the studio? Ridiculous. Um, I, I, when it comes to tendons, for me, and it probably was back around, it wasn't 2006. I think it was probably more... 2009 10 or something when i started i think it was for me it was a case of nom nomenclature which isn't easy for me to say but it was just suddenly reading something saying oh you know you normally call this tendonitis um hmm. maybe it should be tendinosis or maybe you're not quite sure and should be calling it tendinopathy and that kind of triggered um because i like words and i like don't like using the wrong words or using different words so is that still something, I mean, you probably came over the distinction between those two a long time before, but is it something that's quite healthy for therapists to distinguish? Is it useful? Uh, so um, there has been a lot of shift in the evidence over the last few years in terms of what we're calling it. And um, what we what we used to call it was tendonitis. And um, the tendonitis really was a term that, um, probably started in the say 70s and it was related to this thinking that it was inflammatory so it was an inflammatory problem um, and therefore the suffix itis uh, and then the the, uh, the big I guess you could say the big problem with that is that um, everyone treated it as an inflammatory problem so they treat it with um, you know ice and uh, anti-inflammatories and rest uh, and we've then found out that with those treatments, it doesn't actually get better. It doesn't get better long term anyway. Uh, so then, then um, there was sort of a big push with research in the in the sort of 80s and 90s, and uh, we found out. Well, initially we found out it's not inflammatory. Um, so there were studies done where they looked at cells within tendons, and they found there was no real signs of inflammatory cells. Um, and that was in the 90s. And then everyone sort of started thinking it's not inflammatory. Let's call it tendinosis. Um, and we went to tendinosis at that point. Uh, and in the 2000s, 90s and 2000s, when I was starting to learn about tendons uh, through, through sort of undergrad and PhD, that's what we used to call it. But then um, what's happened more recently is um, there are people around the world who are focused on uh, looking at inflammatory signs in tendinopathy. Uh, there's a group in Oxford uh, led by uh, Stephanie Dakin, um, and they probably have done the most work recently looking at uh, if it is inflammatory. And they've, they've found pretty, pretty, you know, pretty categorically that it, there's inflammatory signature there. It may not be the same as the inflammation you see you know, when you sort of do an acute injury and there's an inflammatory response, uh, but there's certainly inflammation. Um, and uh, so that now has changed things again. And so now we're thinking it's possibly is inflammatory and, uh, or there are, you know, there's, there's, an, there's a unique inflammatory signature that's associated with tendinopathy. Uh, so, uh, so now what we, what we had, we had a consensus group in 2018 uh, of sort of international tendinopathy experts and we met up we had three rounds of a Delphi survey and then we met up at the end and we discussed what we should be calling it and in that study we decided that it should be called uh, tendinopathy 
And the reason for that is tendinopathy doesn't assume any uh, it doesn't assume any uh, pathology per se. So you're not assuming that there's an inflammatory or there's a degenerative pathology as we as we have thought over the last few decades. Uh, it's just all it is is pain and pathology within the tendon. Um, and that's the sort of term that we've recommended now until we learn more about the because it may be that at different parts in the journey, someone is inflammatory and someone is degenerative, or maybe it's just combinations of both of those features of pathology, you know, within the same person at the same time. So we don't we don't really know how it plays out. So it's it's difficult to use those terms that actually have meaning about the pathology. So 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 that's sort of um, a long winded answer to the question. I, I don't even know if I've answered your question there, but no, I think it's that, I think it's useful. Yeah. I think it's useful because it makes people stop um, and and think, actually, that name I'm using might not be quite right here, which could affect my treatment. And I think it's healthy. And I think if you are a therapist, also, I think it helps you for soft tissue therapists. Definitely in 2022, it helps you fit better into the circle of care for that patient because if you start talking to physios not all us probably, probably a lot of physios about tendonitis and it's always tendonitis tendonitis it kind of shows a little bit of a lack of reading and a bit of lack of care of maybe what you're calling things so it is kind of important um if you use the tendinopathy then it shows oh yeah you've picked up on it that you're keeping up to date and you're kind of you've got to you know you care for what you're actually calling things how does it change with regards to sticking with that kind of difference how's it changed with regards to treatments, I mean, you mentioned that when everything was tendonitis, it was a case of, I oh, we need to ice this um, because mm. we need to get the inflammation down. How did the change to maybe tendinosis affect treatments? Yeah, look, it uh, it did, it affected it a lot. It uh, So we went through a period where, um, as I say, it was, it was all ice and it was rest and that was the main treatment um, and people would sort of get better because if you give them if you do rest you do feel better but then it's going to come back again at some point when you start to load um, so then what happened was um, there was a few people um, that were interested in starting to do loading and exercise for tendinopathy and it probably started in the us with stanish and kerwin um, and they were probably the first ones. I think that was in the 80s. They started doing some eccentric loading. Uh, their, their eccentric loading was um, eccentric loading, and but they were particularly interested in the upper limb, but they also did some lower limb loading. Um, they would do eccentric loading, and then they would uh, do it quickly. They would do it faster with speed. Um, and um, uh, they had a protocol, and uh, that seemed to be beneficial. Um, and then after that, um, uh, Hock and Alfredson uh, came up with his loading program. So, and that probably really sort of, I guess, changed the whole landscape of how we would treat tendons. Um, and it probably is still having really sort of, you know, quite uh, strong effects now in how people manage tendinopathy. He came up with a different program. His was an eccentric program. And I'll, and I'll explain for, for people listening, eccentric is just, it's the contraction where you're lengthening. So it's basically a lengthening contraction of the muscle. Um, so he, he got people, he was doing calf work and he was getting them to drop over a step very slowly with heavy load. So it was different to the Alfredson program because it was really slow now. And he also did very heavy load. So he changed what he was doing and he got some really good outcomes uh, with his group of patients. Um, so, so then people started thinking, we should be loading the tendon and maybe it's loading it that is required to get it healthy again, to get it better. So then we're thinking very uh, bio. If you look at the biopsychosocial model, we're thinking very, very bio at that point. That was in the 90s. And people were thinking, all you need to do is load the tendon heavily. It's going to get better. Uh, it's going to heal. Um, so, so that was Hawkins contribution. And then since then, there's been a few other exercise programs like the, um, the uh, Silbernagel program. Karen Silbernagel from Delaware University, she's, uh, she's come up with a really good progressive program which involves all, so all types of loading. So it involves, you know, uh, concentric and eccentric loading, uh, eccentric loading, and then she even progresses to things like hopping um, and uh, plyometric loading. Um, 
and then there's also the heavy slow resistance program and this is a this is a progressive gym based program where you get people in the gym and they do things that are heavy and progressive right up to things that you would call you know in inverted commas maximal strength type dosages like you know four sets of six or something like that but they start off at four sets of 15. Um, so they progress down from endurance to, to maximal loading and it's really it's a really good strength and conditioning type model and that is also another model that's out there what we know about all these uh, exercise models is that there really isn't much difference between them if you look at the efficacy they they all seem to be effective and um you know there, there's there's some effect they work but they don't there's no there's not a huge difference in terms of the outcomes when you're looking at these programs so it's it's and that's interesting in itself because we can sort of tease out why that is um, is it because the loading doesn't work very well or it doesn't need to be specific or um, is it because other factors like um, you know some of those psycho psychological and social factors are changing or other factors are influencing recovery rather than the actual you know bio loading the tendon so I think I think what we've learned um, is that uh, loading is is definitely the, the, the it's definitely the key and the dominant treatment for tendinopathy at this point there's, there's no doubt about that loading is is really 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 the key treatment but we don't know we do, we really don't know much about how it works and uh, um, we have gone away from this view that it's just biological so you're just loading the tendon to get you know this healing of the tendon because we know that that probably doesn't happen so there must be other mechanisms it, it influences pain somehow um, it probably has an effect um, you know possibly via um, you know mediating factors could be things like even the psychological factors that we talked about so fear avoidance changes in fear avoidance and self-efficacy um, as people start to load more are possible but we just we, we just don't know at this point because no one's really looked at that in, in any great detail uh, but we, we we've sort of moved away from just a biological model of, of how patients can get better with exercise um, so it is interesting there's a real you know evolution of exercise but at the end of it we're left with this sort of um, we're left with this evidence that you know you could pretty much do many different types of loading for ten up then you probably wouldn't be uh, too far off the mark and uh, as long as you're, you're doing something that's progressive that the patient's into that they're interested in that is uh, you know something they enjoy uh, something they stick to I think that's really important um, you know you're probably going to have some decent outcomes with loading uh, in amongst some of the other education and things that you do so so it's, it's not a bad position to be in but people are looking for a holy grail and I think that's the that's the problem people tend to think right loading what's the right way to do it and that's what I tend to talk about in courses is that, that you know there's no there's no one way of doing it it's just a, it's a it's a process it's a it's sort of you're looking at you know you're looking at trying to develop self-management self-efficacy in people in doing things over time not not so much just uh you know one 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 way of doing it and it's probably slightly different to when you're developing strength and conditioning in athletes is that you know we know it has to be specific you have to go from this to that to that and there's the periodization and there's the different phases and things and rehab can be similar but um, I don't think it necessarily has to be uh, like that because you're dealing with pain. and Pain is very, very different outcome to functional uh, development. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, gold dust. Um, don't forget, people, if you listen to this, then feel free to write some um, questions in the comments. I'm interested, actually, while we continue, I'm, I'm interested in, I know some people in here of the regulars, I'm interested when and how you added loading to your original um, studies, because if you did a traditional level three or level four course or even a level, no, level five as well, ye, I'm pretty confident if you're in the UK that there is no mention of loading whatsoever. Um, level five was a case of different novel ways to increase range of movement, which is fine if range of movement is an issue, but it's not always a problem. 
there's plenty of people who are flexible and actually in pain. Sometimes too much flexibility is a cause of pain, um, as in hypermobility and stuff. So the people who are in here, so like Becky and Catherine, I'm not calling on you just because you're both late, but it'd be nice to hear, how did you learn about loading? Um, was it through prior, was it from personal training background? How did you distinguish between concentric and eccentric and isometric contractions and a number of reps and sets where did you get it from i'm interested in hearing from you listening to us live um yeah really interesting peter i'm wondering whether you might know with the different kind of focus on isometric or concentric or eccentric was a common characteristic that the uh, person in the study had to reach some form of fatigue or not uh it's a good question. It's, it's a really good question. The, the problem with the literature is it's really poorly described. Right. So we've done some trials uh, and, sorry, some reviews and other people have on this, and it's, it's really uh, terribly described. So you get, you get, you get these um, studies that talk about exercise, and in the uh, method section, they've got like one paragraph, and they say, we did, you know, um, this exercise program is centric, just like Alfredson did. And it was, you know, three sets of 15, knee bent, knee straight, and that's it. That's all you get, you know, so you don't you don't get the detail and it, it's hard to make sense of it. So one of the big pushes in, in uh, exercise now is, is re proper reporting. Uh, because without proper reporting of exercise in trials, you can't really replicate as a clinician if you pick up that study. You can't actually do the same thing the authors have done. So um so that that that's a bit of a shame uh but there is um most people progress if you look at the reviews and what is out there most people seem to progress based on pain so so what that means is instead of using functional uh fatigue or um, capacity and as an outcome or as a way to progress they actually progress by pain so when you've got um when you've got uh, pain at a certain level, so the pain is generally better and below a certain threshold, then people are happy to start to say, okay, let's go to the next level of loading. So it's, it tends to be more pain-based rather than fatigue-based. And that that's probably a an issue because um, uh, we did a review recently. One of my students, Fatma Hassani, who just finished their PhD, did a review on Achilles exercise programs. And what we found is that if you look at the Achilles exercise programs that are out there that have tracked whether people get stronger over the 12 weeks they're doing it, what we found is that people actually don't get stronger when they're doing these exercise programs uh, for Achilles to not over 12 weeks, which is really strange. Because if you said to someone, look, I'm going to give you this exercise program over 12 weeks, you know, one of the main ways you're going to sell it to them is you're probably going to be stronger at the end of it. Uh, but actually what we find is that in these trials, they don't get stronger. Uh, which is really weird because when you do exercise you should get stronger so it's telling us that they're either not doing it not doing it properly not doing it enough um or the exercise that is being prescribed is is not good uh so uh it's it's i think there's a lot of room for improvement um and it's not a simple case of as we know in a biopsychosocial uh, approach uh, patients have got various factors contributing to their pain. It's not a simple case of saying, if you get stronger, you're gonna, your pain's gonna be better. Uh, but uh, strength is probably important for a lot of our uh, tendon patients, just from a point of view of function. So um, strength is related to quality of life and will probably help them to function better. Uh, so I think, I think we're missing an opportunity if we've got patients in our clinics and we're not giving them advice about how to also get stronger, especially some of the older ones. I see a lot of Achilles patients who are in their 70s and uh, they walking is the only thing they, they really do. And uh, the Achilles can sometimes just completely, you know, uh, disable them and uh, from walking and they just, you know, they, they can't walk anymore because of their Achilles problem. And that that is not only pain, but also uh, related to function and weakness. So I think I think there's a lot we can do um, from a functional restoration point of view. And especially in some of our older patients, because we know as we get older, we get weaker um, generally. Great, great points there. Um, 
yeah so it's it's having the i think another thing is having the confidence to I mean, it kind of makes perfect sense if somebody can't do something and they need to do that then they're gonna have to get them to instill their i don't like saying it proved to their own brain because that's kind of really dark dangerous water and people would shout at me but you've got to prove to yourself which you are kind of doing to your brain that I can do this. You know, that kind of surprise moment when somebody thinks I can't stand on tiptoe on one foot, no way it's going to ache. And then they kind of do it. And then suddenly mm. that starts mm. the recovery, doesn't mm. it? Because then they can mm. do that and they stop avoiding it. But it's also mm. a case of, I think for soft tissue therapists who aren't familiar with loading and that you've got to have the confidence to actually, if you've done your assessment to say to somebody, you know what, try standing on two tiptoes now put your hands on the shelf try and shift it over to one now put all the weight on one without having a like a white look on your face thinking oh my god they're going to snap you've got to have the confidence <laughs> in the patient as well haven't you otherwise and I, we've all done it but um so yeah so i'm really interested in soft tissue therapists and what they've done to add that loading training a few people of you have answered thank you very much i'll come to your questions in a sec by the way guys have asked some questions thank you uh, Becky said eccentrics and tendinopathies were covered on my degree. Cool. So it's nice to know that at least when you get to university, they start talking about loading. Um, I can't be called talking sets and reps, more to level of failure fatigue. Nice one, Becky. Carol Brown says we were taught on the sports therapy HND. It's a higher national diploma through different stages of rehab and loading was one of them. That's nice to hear. We did have an introduction to SSC module on the course. Loading was pain specific. Glenn says got the heads up on all of this from old school weightlifters and PTs early in in the early zero zeros or two thousands certainly not in classrooms okay it's a little mixture there it's definitely a bolt-on that people need to do unfortunately we've got a lot of um researchers now who are getting involved in courses and trying to get research out into um clinics as well i'm thinking of people like dr claire minchel who we've had on the show a few times um fiona higgs as well people are coming from research because that's part of the problem isn't it researchers aren't actually on the shop floor so maybe they're not recording everything because they're thinking well we don't need to know this. I know what I'm doing, but mm. then it doesn't translate, mm. does it? When we kind of try and put it into practical, yeah. are things getting better now? People like yourself are in research, and your colleagues who are still clinicians and have seeing patients. Is that kind of a new breed of research which is going to be better quality? I look. It's it's um, it is difficult to say. I think um, I think uh, you don't have to be a clinician to be a good researcher and tick those boxes of making sure that you're reporting things properly. I think I think it was more so, uh, but it does help. I, th I Personally, I think it, being a, a clinician and also doing research is is beneficial. There's pros and cons. It, 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 makes, your, it makes you feel like you're basically running around not doing anything well. Um, <laughs> and I think a lot of people have that feeling that are busy, but um, I certainly do with uh, with being in clinic and then thinking oh, I've got all these grants to write. What am I doing here in clinic? Uh, but it does. It's very beneficial being in clinic one day a week, which I'm, which is where I am now because it does give you a lot of a lot of. Um, well, it's it's enjoyable working with patients, but it also gives you a lot of um, a lot of ideas from the patients directly. So it's, it, it is good, uh, but I think I think the problem has been just over over time we just. The research quality has just gone really up over the last 10 years and people are starting to report there's all these things now reporting standards and um if you do a trial or a cohort study or whatever it is you have to report certain things so so that's improving a lot and uh, i think in the future it's going to benefit and we're going to we're going to have more options to us as clinicians and better studies to go by and that's uh, and that's really that's really what we need i think uh, better better evidence to make decisions on Excellent. Cool. And it's interesting as well, because that coincides with now in the last few years, there's been a more CPD about geared it towards helping therapists understand research and read papers and, and kind of evaluate papers and critically appraising themselves. Like I said, Dr. Fiona Higgs has put some CPD regarding that. I think Claire Minchel has done some as well, but it's a great form of CPD helping kind of people understand the research um and where to find papers and that and that's pretty healthy so yeah i'm interested in um bum, 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 bum. yeah one of the things which a lot of soft tissue therapists pre or um undergraduates do touch on and i was interested to see this in your blog is cross friction or deep tissue all the different names they give it rubbing a tendon hard um yeah, yeah. 
it was interesting because there was actually, I think you commented on a paper which showed, and this kind of made me feel a little bit sick in the back of my throat, that the results for eccentric loading were the same as kind of, I think you referred to it as pressure massage. Hmm. Um, hmm. What's all that about? I wasn't very happy to read that. It didn't it didn't satisfy my biases at all? But what was happening there? <laughs> um, why didn't it satisfy your biases? Well, because I've always felt that rubbing a tendon, this idea of mechanotransduction happening from somebody externally, I never bought into the whole Syriax thing. I didn't feel, yeah. apart from the fact that it hurts a lot, and a lot mm. of it, a lot of the time, mm. it's taught that you just tell your mm. patient to stick a bit of wood in between their teeth and put up with it. This idea yeah. that you were rubbing it better and causing kind of yeah. cellular regeneration, yeah. I, I couldn't, yeah. I was mixed. I looked into it. I didn't see enough to make me believe mm. in it. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good point. I, I think, I, I think the way to think about it is that you have to do something active, I believe, with most people to get them better. Um, now, that doesn't have to be specific exercise like the heavy slow resistance or the Alfredson exercise that we talked about earlier. What active could be just advice about how to resume activities in a safe way. Um, and that's and that could be the active intervention that you do. So I think I think we have to be thinking that this is a condition where you do need to improve their self-efficacy, their ability to load. And that could be through sort of physical activity and the stuff they're doing generally. Um, or it could be through specific therapeutic exercise. So I think I think at a base level, um, I agree with you. I think there is, you know, my 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 I guess you could say biases and thinking is that we do also need to do something active with them. Uh, so that so then those studies do seem a bit strange uh, because you're getting this approach where you're getting similar outcomes uh, with a with a very passive approach. Um, there's a number of possible explanations for that one is one is on a scientific level so there's bias in these in some of these trials and maybe you know the outcome times or the outcomes they've used uh, you know the blinding is often difficult to achieve and things like that uh, don't forget patients patients really really uh, one of the key drivers to placebo as we know is um, patient expectation and uh, it's interesting to see that a lot of placebo trials use passive treatments like ultrasound or um, massage or gels and often if you and they often ask people in these placebo trials uh, did you think this was the real treatment or not and they, and they think it is so patients are really not very educated generally to know that they need active treatments for their achilles tendon problem but um, so there's a big expectation that from patients that these passive treatments will probably work for them um, so there's bias levels but there's also uh, there's there's also other levels that could explain it. So, for example, you know, if if you do massage, maybe there is a, a, re, a short term reduction in pain, and maybe that does lead to then greater self efficacy and improvements in physical activity and other things that uh, get them better. I, I believe that patients can get themselves better most of the time. So, if you get, have a tendon problem, um, you know, what a lot of people do is they just reduce their loading for a short amount of time and then go back to it gradually. And that's basically the essence of treatment. The essence of management of, of active management is reducing load and then bringing it back again when the body's ready for it. So, uh, so I think uh, maybe there's, there's, maybe that's happening in some of these passive treatments. Um, you know, may, maybe that's sort of happening as a byproduct or as a, as a, as a sort of, uh, as, a, as an intentional or unintentional byproduct in some of these trials. So it's, 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 it's interesting, but it also, it also speaks to the fact that exercise is not, um, is not a panacea and it's not necessarily head and shoulders above every other intervention. Uh, I, I do believe in an active approach, um, but uh, when you look at the evidence and you look at trials like that and you look at the whole evidence, it's, uh, exercise is, is very strong, but uh, there are uh, numerous examples of where it's similar to other passive treatments like shockwave therapy and uh, massage. Um, and I guess the, the fallback with the exercise is that, yes, it probably is going to be more beneficial for your general health because you're taking an active approach and you're getting stronger. Um, but we've already talked about the, some of the issues with that already. So look, it's, it, it, is, it is a developing literature and it is a developing area. And I think that um, we do need to be honest as clinicians to say 
uh, we don't have all the answers at the moment and we don't we don't have an approach uh, but if you can argue an active approach to your patient where uh, they're going to take control of their condition and be able to uh, you know gradually increase their activity and be more functional that's sort of the approach that I take in arguing uh, that you know this is probably something that you want to consider um, but you do have patients who say look I don't want to exercise I actually don't like exercising I'm not going to do that um, and for those patients then maybe manual therapy or maybe something like shockwave therapy is is an alternative as well Thank you very much. It's a very detailed answer. Um, I wasn't quite sure if in there you were suggesting or you didn't actually comment on, is there a potential or have studies shown that biologically there can be some kind of a kind of transduction caused by an external stimuli, so this kind of cross friction? Is that, I'm not sure that it depends where I read and it's so tricky as always, but is that potentially on the table that you are causing cellular kind of regeneration by rubbing on the tendon from the outside? Uh, it is, um, it's something that, um, it's, uh, you're right, it is quite tricky because it's that sort of, it's that sort of difference between animal or, it, it's the difference between sort of um, um, non-human studies because studies like that are really difficult to do in humans mm. uh, and we just don't know at this stage in humans if you, if you do that type of stuff, what sort of effects it has biologically, locally at the tendon. Uh, there are there are certainly studies that have shown in uh, I'm pretty sure having read these like quite a few years ago now in animal studies that there are there possibly are some biological effects mechanotransductive effects but I don't I don't I haven't seen anything in humans um, it's probably quite it's probably the, the cell tendons are quite obviously complex complex mechanotransduction. Uh, and responsive cells to various stimuli. Um, I, I think it would be difficult to imagine that uh, if you're doing a massage type treatment where you're pushing in a certain way that it's going to replicate the mechanotransduction that is required to get to a tendon to be sort of, you know, better at taking load. I think um, they're two different types of stimuli. So I, I, I think I think it's probably biologically not that as a plausible an argument. Okay, cool. That's fine. That satisfies. I'm happy now. I was getting a bit worried. Um, <laughs> but I like the fact that you and, and you do this continuously in your blogs that the importance of the patient belief and I believe you did some studies maybe but it was Dr. Chris Barton, maybe, but about empowerment and the importance of, yeah, the patient kind of buying and things like that. So giving the patient some of what they want might be what helps them recover. You know, it's an important factor. So you should never kind of say, this doesn't work. I'm not going to do it to you. Um, it's not a good business model either. Isn't it? So they just go somewhere else and get it. So very interesting. Right. Well, look, um, I've got a few questions in here, which I must go back to because otherwise I'll get angry emails. Let's have a little look if that's all right with you. Yeah, um, perfect. Let's have a look. So, Becky Carroll, going back to um, the eccentric and different forms of loading, is there a point with a tendinopathy where eccentric loading would be deemed less effective? Um, it's a good question. Um, generally, when yeah, I think um, I think uh, if you are uh, First of all, if you're in a lot of pain, if you're in huge amounts of pain, loading is probably not the answer because you need to manage the pain first. And that and that often relates to just good old-fashioned reducing the activity. Um, and then uh, the other time when it may not be a good option to do exercise is when they've failed exercise before. So if they've failed a good exercise program, I, I, I find it hard to then, you know, say, look, do it again. Uh, if, it, if, if you think it's really good. And there are patients that just don't respond to exercise. I, I see it quite a bit. And they do the right thing and they just don't respond. So, And, and you're scratching your head to why that is. But um, uh, I guess those situations... Um, ones, the other one you can argue it in is the ones... And this is where subgrouping, I think, is going to become more of a thing in the future. Uh, if you look at different patients, some patients are quite uh, weak 
uh, if, you, if you assess them. And other patients are really strong, uh, but they still have similar levels of pain. So you could also argue, and I think it's reasonable to say in the ones that are strong, you don't need, loading is not as important. Um, a, a specific strengthening exercises that we sort of do, uh, maybe in the ones that are strong already, you can take more of an approach where you just educate them about activities and physical activity modification and trying to get them on board with that rather than actually the, the actual specific therapeutic exercise we do. Why put them through a program where they're going to need to do you know, lots of exercise half an hour a day for 12 weeks or more when they don't really need to? So um, I, think, I think there's that argument as well. So there are a few instances where maybe exercise, this therapeutic exercise we do, like the eccentrics, is not necessary. Interesting. Great answer. Um, yeah, that's good to know because I think we all have those patients where they come in and we're trying to load them and we just run out of weights in our little clinic. We just haven't got enough kettlebells. Mm -hmm. We're like, and we kind of think, right, we're going to get a squat rack now. And it's nice to know that you've given us permission that maybe strength work isn't the answer if they're already strong. Maybe we need a different stimulus. That's that's a great question, Becky. I was interested as well. It made me think that question about, I think, Greg Lehman, who's going to be on next week uh, talking about his reconciling pain and, and psychosocial or I can't remember what it is buyer with a psychosocial um he was challenging the other day and something which I think I got from him probably about 10 years ago um the whole idea of um insertional tendon issues like insertional Achilles or gluteal or um proximal hamstring where the whole idea if you're doing an exercise and you're compressing that tendon against the origin against the bone could irritate it and delay recovery and I kind of took that and I thought I had quite a lot of success at that because one of the great things about therapists being taught, just stretch it. If you've got a painful Achilles, stretch it, stretch it, stretch it. It was all those insertion of Achilles issues where they were pushing it against the calcaneus. In theory, when I took that away from them, it might have been my own bias, but confirmation bias, but it seemed like it gave them the rest they needed. It desensitized it and then they could load it. Then the other day, Greg, as he infamous, infamously does on Twitter or somewhere, kind of went, ah, tenders can handle that. We're kind of saying too much about this whole compression thing. You know, give them an exercise. If they're over there and it's not really hurting, then don't worry about it. Where are mm. you with that whole idea on, like, I was thinking of maybe eccentric over a step, stopping it flat mm. for the moment and not proceeding because you mm. might be. How are you with that? Yeah, it's, it's a really, it's a good discussion. And again, it's one of those things that's debated a bit, but it's, um, generally, I, I, I agree that if you take a tendon into the end of range with, um, uh, say you do a dorsiflexion to the extreme range, you're going to get compression of the Achilles against the calcaneum. Uh, that, that could be part of the problem. Um, if, you, if you're combining those compressive loads and the tensile loads, we, there, there is some evidence, that's pretty good evidence that on a biological basic science level, that possibly is not a good thing. Um, uh, but I think Greg's point is more related to what is the threshold of this amount of load that we can take. And that really is not very well established. And certainly I think there's people that can, you know, take more than others and it's, it maybe isn't as much of a problem for. So um, I think it probably needs to be an individual approach where you sort of look at, uh, look at compression. Um, I think for me, common sense is the key thing. So if you've got someone with a hamstring tendon problem, uh, proximal hamstring tendon problem, you don't, you, you, you don't necessarily want, it, want them to be doing deep squats right to the bottom uh, with heavy, heavy load, because that's going to be you know, very compressive for them. Um, you know, uh, so that, that sort of common sense approach uh, to deal with that, I think, is, is the way to go. You might, you might you know, stop them at 90 degrees of hip flexion um, so, so things like that can be quite helpful, but I, I sort of agree with Greg, you don't, you don't want to also be going on about it too much and you're saying, oh, you know, you can't, because you, you do certainly see patients in clinic who have been told, oh, you, you know, you, you absolutely can't do that, that's going to, you know, mm. that's going to destroy the tendon. So it's, it's just having a healthy dialogue around, uh, around some of these things is, I think, the key thing. So not, not, not uh, making it sound as if it's, it's going to be a real, you know, uh, something that's going to be, you know, impossible for them or very difficult or cause, you know, uh, real significant problems for them because then that that leads to real insecurities in their mind subconsciously about their tendon, which are carried forward as we know for years and years and years and years. So that's that's I think I think I think uh, 
a healthy dialogue is important. Yeah, great point. But I think that I think that can be so difficult. Again, it's old school. The way you're taught, soft tissue therapists are churned out with this idea that we were talking about Diane Jacobs last week. This idea that you're the operator, you're the one who stands there with all the answers, and you tell them what to do, and you bend them and twist them and sort out their kinetic chain, and and it has to work because it's like a car mechanic. You've got the kind of like manual in front of you, and you're going to put them back how they are. And although you say it's kind of like, oh, that's common sense, isn't it? Don't make them go down there. If we've been taught, I say we like soft tissue therapists, if, often if you've been taught something on a course, then you will do that to the patient, even if they are screaming, wincing, not looking very happy. Um, you haven't even asked them what, how they feel about it because you think you're following a manual. So it is tricky to stand back and put the patient first, the whole patient centered approach, because we're taught. And people mm. pay a lot of money for courses which are so not patient centered. They're so mm. like, this is the anatomy mm. train. This is causing that. You need to bend that and twist that and do that. Mm. So mm. it's tricky. You make mm. it sound so simple, but it's, it is hard, isn't it, for therapists to change the chip a little bit? It is. It is. Yeah. No, it, it, is, it, is, it is really difficult. But I think it's, it's also really rewarding when you start to involve the patient more and understand their perspective and really you know in a meaningful way get some real good dialogue with them i think that's that's probably really much more rewarding uh than sort of going down your own path with the treatments that you think this is this is what they need um i i, I found that because i mean i i you know in a similar way to probably what you're describing would be you know um uh really sort of uh, a lot less, I guess, patient-centered than what I am now. But I, I, I just like it. I just enjoy talking to patients now, and much more than what I did before. It was, you know, this is this is the approach that you know is the best approach. Now, this is this is what we're doing. But uh, now it's more a dialogue, which I think is is a, is a lot more enjoyable, definitely. Yeah, that's really cool. That's good advice. And it is nice on the other side. We've said that a few times. It might feel a bit weird taking that step back and saying, I'm not quite sure this is to tell the truth, but we're going to try this. It's that approach sounds so kind of horrendous and scary to a lot of therapists. But once you do it, the, 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 you fear that the patient won't like you anymore. They'll think that you're not competent. But in actual fact, it's a much nicer way to be treated by somebody who's talking to you and asking and seeing how this works yeah. and they're not afraid to say this isn't working let's try something else it's it's fine guys it's bright on the other side I promise you right let's have a look phil griffiths oh go on so you're gonna say something i was just gonna say it's it's also really important uh, i think there's a balance there because you do in 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 therapeutic alliance you have to have trust so you have to you have to be you have to be really knowledgeable and um you have to be uh, really able to understand the patient and understand their problem and um, convey that but at the same time it's okay to say um, that you know we're, we're, we've got all these treatments we understand what your problem is I think I think patients in therapeutic alliance patients number one thing is patients knowing that you understand their problem and if you can if you can convey that you understand their problem and you've got a handle of it um, and maybe it's not the first one that you've seen. Uh, they, they, they they really appreciate that. And then and then if you're a bit uncertain about the treatments, you say, look, uh, we don't have great treatments. We can we can do this, this, and this. We're going to try various things. Uh, I think they're fine with that. But as long as as long as you convey that they you know you, you 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 understand their problem, I think that's an important thing. Great stuff. Great points. Um, oh, it's already nine o'clock, mate. It's gone so quickly. Are you okay to take a couple more questions? <laughs> Yep, yep, yep. Sure. That's fine. Yeah, okay. I know I said till go nine, it, but uh, it, Phil it. Griffiths, thanks for the question, Phil. Sorry it's taken a while to get to you. Phil Griffiths said, Is there any difference in results from, say, resistance bands to weight loading? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, it really does depend on the problem. It's, it's, it, if, you can, if you can get enough load progressively onto the system with resistance bands, I don't think it's a problem. It's, it's, uh, obviously, around the shoulder, around the elbow, around uh, the um, around the hip, they're really useful. Around the um, around the knee and around the ankle, I find they are, are limited because you do need to get to quite significant amounts of loading around those regions. So uh, I find them quite limited there. But um, you know, as a starting point, they're they're, they're generally okay. So I, I would say pick your patient with that one, definitely. 
Great answer. Like it, Phil. Come back if you've got any uh, replies to that. Catherine um, says, as Brian will know, we were taught peace and love. Also, please love all these acronyms. They're great. I have also done additional training and done my level three in personal training. Yeah, personal training. It's a great combination, I find. I love it when I get personal trainers who want to get into soft tissue therapy. It's just a beautiful combination. Good one, Catherine. I hope they're working well for you. Um, Carol Brown, I've already mentioned. There was some more questions here. Got the heads up. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, here you go. Catherine Reimer says, would you work more in isolation exercises, control split squats, for example, where one leg doesn't become more dominant and try to take over? So choice of exercise um, loading. Uh, so is that single leg exercise? Or was that or? I guess so, yeah. I suppose you, yeah, the idea of focusing on one leg at a time, dividing it up. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good question. It is not, uh, probably not necessary unless you can see that there is a, a deficit side to side. If there's an impairment side to side, or if they're really favoring, or if they're really, you know, you assess them in clinic and they're really, I think you mentioned this before, Matt, when you've got someone who, you know, is very apprehensive about getting onto one leg. You know, uh, if they're very apprehensive about getting onto one leg, uh, you, you sort of mentioned it from the therapist being quite apprehensive as well, which is, which often happens. But uh, if the patient is apprehensive and you try and get them to do a calf raise or a hop and they don't want to do it, uh, then you probably don't want to load them double leg because they're going to be favoring their good leg. So you can pick up those signs. I, I tend to look for signs of fear avoidance and apprehension and then go, go the single leg if that's the case. It's a beautiful art, isn't it? Um, playing around with patients who are showing fear avoidance, um, mm. even if it's like, I don't know, dropping a pen, ask them to pick it up and hand it to you or something like that. So you can be quite mm. kind of cunning mm. and then mm. gently break it and saying, you know, you said you couldn't squat and you just sat down in that chair mm. and stood up again or sat down. It's, it's mm. fun. It's exciting. That's what it should be. That's it, why is. It, is. it is. I agree. Cool. Okay. Well, um, look, I don't want to keep you longer than I think I covered most of the questions in there. Yes, I did. So well, obviously so much we could have talked about, but hopefully that's given people listening to the show an idea about the world of tendons and loading and not necessarily thinking that loading is the be all and end all. We've touched on uh, recognizing the patient expectations really important. We looked at kind of placebo and context effect, but obviously you go into this and so much more on your courses, which is coming to the UK. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, just to repeat the dates, Newport, March the 20th, still spaces on that. Epsom looks like it's full, March the 25th. London, March 26th, and then Surrey, March the 27th, if the demand is there. What um, I always ask this to people who, who give courses, what are some of the kind of, you've given so many courses over the years, but some of those eureka moments where you've said something and you just felt that, oh, kind of things with, with your audience. What are some of those that you've kind of realized? Um, I think courses are a really good way to consolidate your knowledge and to be able to uh, deliver it in a in a way that um, really is uh, able to speak to people. Uh, what I find is that you get better at delivering the information, and there's so many instances in courses where. I've been discussing something and it's just and and then you sort of think to yourself oh that's such a better way that I've just um, come up with to actually explain that and it's just iterative over over years um, and you and you get that because you sort of you learn because as you're explaining it you sort of think oh yeah uh, I've just actually taught myself something there about how to explain it um, so that, that 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 you do get those feelings a lot um, um, but in terms of uh, in terms of actual, it's a hard question, Matt. I, I, I don't know. I can't. I can't. I can't say. And it, and it might be because I haven't done the course for. I haven't done the course. Oh, of course, of yeah, we had a slight pandemic in the in the way of yeah. yeah. We forget about that. And that's, yeah, and that's why over over the next week uh, when I'm travelling over to the uh, Copenhagen conference, I'm going to be. Uh, as I said, overhauling the course and putting all the new stuff in. But um, I want to get myself excited about uh, delivering it again. But there's certainly, yeah, there's certainly lots of um, lots of lots of things uh, that come out of uh, teaching courses that I think are positive for the people that take it, but also yourself.
yeah it's a good way of looking at it there's some pre-reading for the course as well i was going to ask you who is this course suitable for do you need a certain level of knowledge in order to learn from it that's my first question and the second question is going to be can you get that from the pre-reading i know you give like four hours of video or something for people before the course starts which I think is a great idea. yeah so there's four there's there's about three hours i think it's three hours 43 minutes or something of um pre-reading it's uh videos uh basically uh, the course we we have all sorts of people on there. We have um, we have uh, we 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 get personal trainers. We get um, you know people who are more into massage. We get physios. We get osteos, chiros. So it's a it's a whole range of people that come to the course. Um, generally, uh, everything is relevant to them because it's all rehab. It's my, the the approach that I take is assessment and assessment and um and rehabilitation is, is sort of what i focus on so it's it's pretty relevant i mean some people find uh some bits are more relevant to them than others uh but um generally if you're going to be doing rehab it's it's i think um i think if you're doing some rehab in your practice for tendon patients it's probably going to be relevant great okay we well, heard it there from the horse's mouth as it were people if you are interested in the, around those areas um then you can go again just to re um, repeat the website let's bring this up again so it's uh tendinopathy remember it's got an eye there people remember? it sounds like it's going to be a tendon it's actually uh tendinopathy with an eye um rehab.com um all the information is on there and and like i say also um when you go to that website have a look around because it's a great blog there's some lovely short 14 15 minute podcasts um, and discussions on papers and research that's come out so it's well worth checking out right um thank you so much peter for giving up your time what time is it over there where you are now i've got no idea what the time it is eight o'clock so it's eight o'clock in the morning um wow okay yeah yeah so it's quite early i'm going to take the kids to school now and then i'm going to go back and uh, come back here and do some clinic uh clinic awesome. work Right, mate. Yeah, well, I really yeah. appreciate your time um, and thank you so thank much. You, and hopefully, I don't know whether, no, I don't think um, I don't think we will cross paths. Um, but it would be lovely to catch up with you. Now things are moving around and people are kind of crossing over with different um, conventions and therapies. It would be nice to actually catch up with you in person. Um, I'm going to say goodbye to the people in the lounge. Stick around and I'll say thanks to you um, when I do send them out. But yeah, people, thanks for joining us if you joined us live. Um, if you uh, want to join us live next week, then like I say, we've got Greg Lehman um, with us um, on next Tuesday, 8 o'clock, same time, UK time. He's going to be talking about his reconciling um, pain with biomechanics. That's it. I always get confused. Um, amazing course. I'm biased because I think I was the first person in the UK to actually host that down in Brighton when Greg was like, how much should I charge people for this in his own totally modest, unassuming way? Um, and I told him when he told me how much he thought, I said, what are you talking about? That's way too cheap. It was like 50 quid or something. And it's like, but um, that was like a long time ago. And since then, it's become a huge internationally um, acclaimed course all around the world. And it's it's really sums up a lot of what we've been talking about, even tonight with the whole biopsychosocial and how you shouldn't really divide any of it. And But sometimes you've got to weigh them up differently. So if you're interested in pain, which you all should be, then uh, join us next Tuesday. If you listen to the podcast, then... Um, do us a favor and uh, just leave a little rating and some stars if you've liked it and a comment it just helps us appear in the search results more but on behalf of myself and dr peter maliaras then um i will say good night and and yeah look after each other thank you very much thanks Pat.